listeners and viewers throughout the whole world, more particularly to all shepherds rod believers. Good evening and may the good Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. I would like to read Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 417. Here is the greatest deception that can affect the human mind. These persons believe that they are right when they are wrong. They think that they are doing a great work in their religious life. But Jesus finally tears off their self-righteous covering and vividly presents before them the true picture of themselves in all their wrongs and deformity of religious character. They are found one thing when it is forever too late to have their wants supplied. God has provided means to correct the earring, yet if those who ear choose to follow their own judgment and despise the means which he has ordained to correct them and unite them upon the truth, they will be brought into the position described by the words of our Lord quoted above. Now, what is the means ordained by God to correct God's people? In answerer number 3 on page 30, it says here, beginning from page 29, Indeed, the very word inspiration in its theological significance means to communicate divine instructions free from men's adulteration. Hence, any objection to inspiration can only, in the last analysis, be an attempt to put God out of sight and to bring men to the front, to cut off the only channel through which God can interpret the scriptures, communicate with his people, reveal truth, and unmask error. The Lord has often made manifest in his providence, says this for prophecy, that nothing less than revealed truth, the word of God, can reclaim man from sin or keep him from transgression. See Testimonies to Ministers, page 80. So the only medium, the only channel that God can communicate his people to reveal the truth and unmask the error is through the channel of inspiration. And that is why once you rejected inspiration, the hope is forever gone. Here in 2TG 24, page 19, it says, There is no forgiveness for sinning against the Holy Ghost, against inspiration. Because once rejected, there is nothing else by which a sinner can be brought to Christ. Consequently, there is no more hope for such a one. For there is nothing more that heaven can do to awaken him to his poverty. And hence, no more remedy, no forgiveness of sin. Now, let us study closely, brothers and sisters, and ascertain clearly if the gift of inspiration is in the midst of us. Remember, according to, to SR, it says here in page 95, A hypocrite may hide his sin from the eyes of others and sometimes from his own conscience, but can never impose upon God. Or in other words, uh, brothers and sisters, the spur prophecy here in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, on page 190, the spur prophecy declared clearly that we should not deceive our own self. Here in 190, in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, Many I saw were flattering themselves that they were good Christians, who have not a single ray of light from Jesus. They know not what it is to be renewed by the grace of God. They have no living experience for themselves in the things of God. And I saw that the Lord was wetting his sword in heaven to cut them down. All that every lukewarm professor could realize, the clean work that God is about to make among his professed people. Their friends, do not deceive yourselves concerning your condition. You cannot deceive God, says the true witness. I know their works. The third angel is leading up a people step by step, higher and higher. At every step, they will be tested. So, this reading is reminding us that we cannot deceive God. And accordingly, there might be possibility that even we of ourselves deceiving our own conscience, according to that reading in 2 SR page 95. But the thing is that we cannot impose it to our Almighty God. Now, the most important part that I would like to emphasize brothers and sisters is that we need to study closely with sincerity and honesty to see if 
the movement we belong, the gift of inspiration is manifested in the midst of us. Now, here in Timely Greetings, let me read to you. In 1 TG number 14, page 17, let us read a statement. That we cannot be led into all truth without the gift of the spirit of prophecy. So I would like to read again the statement. 1 TG number 14, page 17. That we cannot be led into all truth without the gift of the spirit of prophecy. So the shepherd's rod is very plain. The, it utters the impossibility that we could arrive into all truth without the gift of the spirit of prophecy in the midst of us. Now I think it is the same in 1 TG number 12, page 17. I would like to read it saying, So important is the living for prophecy in the church as the young man's experience proves that regardless of one's zeal, sincerity, and integrity, he cannot rightly serve God without it. That even one's best work and intention is bound to be at cross purposes with God's. It is therefore high time for the church to start believing all the prophets have written. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Many shepherds rod believers, they try to their utmost ability to, I would like to say, cover up or to confuse or to twist the true meaning of the statement, the living spirit of prophecy. Several times, I meet many Davidians that they are trying to establish that the living spirit of prophecy is the written word of God. That according to them, that even though there is no living inspired human channel, it is still called the living spirit of prophecy for the word of God never dies. And it seems the argument that they use is sometimes, I would like to say, very effective. And brothers and sisters, this is one thing that I would like to say. Of course, there is no neutral position. It is either what they are saying is true or it is either it is wrong. But if the absolute fact is that what the shepherds teach teaches, then at the time when God did not raise any divine inspired interpreter or inspired living human channel, the spirit of prophecy in that period of time is no longer manifesting. And brothers and sisters, I would like to use the term used by the shepherd's rod in 1 TG number 50, the statement that the time will come that everything will cease to be funny in 1 TG number 50, page 15. Now, for example, here in 2 TG number 16, in page 23, I would like to read a statement. And those who think that the spirit of prophecy is a thing of the past that God has left the world to get along as best it can that he no longer bother himself to send a prophet that all such shall find themselves in league with Babylon the great the seat of the dragon and rather than having their names written in the book they will have the mark of the beast and have a part in persecuting the remnant which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now tell me, brothers and sisters, what period of time that God no longer bother himself to send a prophet? Is this statement cannot be applied in the days in which we are living? That when Betty Hotev died in 1955, then many Davidian obtained such idea that God will no longer bother himself to send a prophet anymore? Or we will try to the utmost of our ability to declare that this occurrence is already fulfilled. In 1915, when Sister White died, the Seventh-day Adventists teach that God will no longer send a prophet. But God sent prophet in 1930. I love so much the statement given by Alonso Jones, brothers and sisters, saying that 
the most important thing each of us individually in reality is that we need to study closely what the Lord did say, what inspiration did say, and we will abide what the written word of God is teaching, more particularly to the Shepherd's Rod publication. Now, to repeat again, brothers and sisters, there is no such single citation in the Shepherd's Rod that even though the prophet is dead or in such period of time by which there is no living human channel by which the gift of inspiration or the gift of the spirit prophecy is manifested, that the spirit prophecy is still active. And the result in reality is we are teaching in our own doctrines and not the doctrines of the shepherd's rod. Here in answerer number 3, page 60, it says, Upon the death of Sister White in 1915, the gift of inspiration, the active spur prophecy, became quiescent, no longer manifesting itself for a time. So when the prophet died, the active spur prophecy became inactive, and it is no longer manifesting itself for a time. And also early writings, they have the same statement given by early writings in page 133. Now it says here in early writings, page 133, the gift of prophecy was manifested in the church during the Jewish dispensation. If it disappeared for a few centuries on account of the corrupt state of the church toward the close of that dispensation, it reappeared at its close to usher in the Messiah. Early Writings 133. Now, if you will be saying that the gift of the spirit of prophecy represented by the books, then why is it that Early Writings 133 says that for more than 300 years, the gift of the spirit of prophecy disappeared? There is no such historical event that the writings of the Old Testament, it was disappeared. Brothers and sisters, to repeat again, it would be better for us. I would like to read 2 TG number 17 on page 8. It is better for all of us to acknowledge our failures than to evade the truth. For it is the truth that shall make us free. So it would be better for us to acknowledge our failures than to evade the truth. For it is the truth that shall make us free. 2 TG number 17, page 8. Now, let us go back again to our investigation, brothers and sisters. Yesterday, we focused our attention to Revelation chapter 6, verse 6, in connection with the parable in Matthew 20. Now, the statement in 2SR on page 235, that according to the parable, the very first group of people that had been granted the assurance of never-ending life are those who have been hired at the 11th hour. 2SR 235, it says, Why were the first paid last and the last first? Answer, the pay God's servants receive his eternal life and is characterized by the penny. Therefore, those who are granted the assurance of a never-ending life first are those who were hired first. And according to the parable, it was the company called at the 11th hour. There are those who are marked or sealed with, by the man with the righteous ink horn of Ezekiel 9. Or John calls him the angel with the seal of God and he sealed or marked 144,000. This glorious company is the first who are granted assurance of never tasting death. But if you will view the historical event, it seems that this statement is not real. Because Moses already granted immortality. Elijah, Enoch, and also the multitude of captives in Ephesians 4 verse 8, in Matthew 27 verse 52 and verse 53. Immortality was already granted to them. And who are they? For example, I would like to read early writings. Here in early writings, page, let's read the statement given by the Spirit of Prophecy. 184 in early writings. When Jesus, as he hung upon the cross, cried out, It is finished. The rocks rent. The earth shook, and some of the graves were opened. When he arose, a victor over death and the grave, while the earth was reeling, and the glory of heaven shone around the sacred spot, many of the righteous dead, obedient to his call, came forth for us witnesses that he had risen. Those favored 
rising saints came forth glorified. They were chosen and holy ones of every age from creation down even to the days of Christ. Thus while the Jewish leaders were seeking to counsel the fact of Christ's resurrection, God chose to bring up a company from their graves to testify that Jesus had risen and to declare His glory. Early writings, page 184. So there are many already that have been granted immortality. They were already in heaven. Then how could it be true that the 144,000 living saints are the very first one that have been granted immortality? While in reality, there are many, many saints that have been granted immortality. And that is why such statement can be applied only from 1844 onwards. That among those who died from 1844 onward, the very first group to be granted immortality is the 144,000 living saints, those that have been called at the 11th hour. And that is the reason, to repeat again, why God uses only two kinds of cereals in Revelation chapter 6, verse 6. Now, why is it that the symbolization of the two kinds of cereals barley and wheat is attached by the Almighty God on the third seal, not on the first seal, not on the second seal, not on the fourth seal, not on the fifth seal, neither on the sixth seal or seventh seal. Why it had been attached on the third seal? There must be an accurate significance. Now, I would like to read again this reading in 2SR 234. It says, Why only two kinds of cereals brought to view? Why not five? Or in other words, to repeat again, since the parable of Matthew 20 is connected to Revelation 6 verse 6, according to 2SR 225 and 226, that when Jesus gave the parable to the apostles, he's looking forward to the time when God will give the vision to John in the island of Patmos, more particularly to the third seal. And at the time when God gave the vision to John in the island of Patmos concerning the third seal, Jesus Christ is looking backward to the time when he gave the parable in Matthew 20. So the shepherd's rod here is trying to emphasize why is it that God used only two kinds of cereals in Revelation 6 verse 6 if Revelation 6 verse 6 is connected to Matthew 20 why not five for there are five distinct calls in Matthew 20. And then it says, the two cereals are sufficient to illustrate the thought and to clear the lesson. So, what is the thought, brothers and sisters, by which the two cereals are sufficient to illustrate? And then it says, but the chief reason for only two is to draw attention to the first and last calls. Because reference is made of but two Israels, namely Israel after the flesh, the descendants of Abraham, and after the spirit, the 144,000. So what, what reference which is made by which in that reference, there are only two Israel. Israel after the flesh and Israel after the spirit. And then it says, but the object of the lesson is for the latter who are hired at the 11th hour. For the truth of the parable has never been understood by any other company. So here the, the voice of inspiration, brothers and sisters, to repeat again, is firmly establishing the absolute fact that whatever the truth intended in the parable, it had never been understood by any other company except the saints that will no longer to taste death. Now, what is the truth in the parable that only the living saints understood such truth? Now, going back again to, to SR page 237, it says, Reason why three hours to a movement. The following fact further proves that the church history in this instance is represented by a 24-hour clock dial. If the call came to Israel early in the morning at the 12th hour and the day closed at the following 12th hour, cold day, because the written word of God was in existence for light to the church, then the period that preceded the Bible is symbolically called night. So, the time before... The word of God had been written, that is, the period 
before the Bible, and it is called night according to this reading. Now, remember the Bible according to Evangelism, page I think 256, saying that the Bible is the greater light, and uh, spur prophecy is called the lesser light. Now, I would like to read the, the Bible here in going back to Genesis chapter 1. So it says here, Genesis chapter 1, verse 16. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Genesis chapter 1, verse 16. Now, the Bible declared clearly, brothers and sisters, that the sun, the literal sun, is the greater light and the moon is the lesser light but in a spiritual aspect brothers and sisters the bible is the greater light and the spirit prophecy is the lesser light now let us continue reading in to us our page 237 it says some may question the evidence for allowing three hours to each incident from creation to the fall of adam and again to Enoch and Noah. If God worked on the three-hour schedule with the crucifixion of Jesus, see chart on page 22, and the same rule was followed in the period called day, then he certainly would not follow another rule in the period called night. The reason he has followed that particular rule is to present to his church the exact time of her history by periods. Now, here again, I would like to repeat that the principal reason that Christ followed that particular rule, the three-hour schedule, is to present to his church the exact time of her history by periods. So, the statement is plainly telling to his church. It is Jesus Christ who will be the one to present to his church one thing that Jesus Christ will present to his church. The exact time of her history by periods. So, this church fully understand her history by periods. The exact time. Now, I would like to re-emphasize this sentence and give little illustration. For example, if you are presenting something you are conducting a lecture to a congregation. And your main purpose in presenting or in that presentation of that subject is to let the congregation understand the exact time of her history by periods. But after such presentation, the congregation by which your intention is to let them understand but the fact is, after you finish your presentation, they did not understand. Then, then what is the, the thought then? Uh, we might say that the, the congregation is very slow to understand. Or either the blame would be on the one who made the presentation that he had not been able to persuade or he had not been able to give the necessary information by which congregation could be able to comprehend the exact time of her history by periods. But if we are talking about Jesus Christ, the omnipotent God, omniscience, and omnipresence. The statement here in 2SR 237 that it is Jesus Christ who will present to his church the exact time of her history by periods. In what way? Through the medium of the subject in Matthew 20. Why our Almighty God followed such particular rule? Three-hour schedule according to this reading in 2SR 237. And for sure, the church mentioned in this reading is the 11th hour church, the fifth call, because the shepherd's rod already declared in 2SR 234 that the truth of the parable in Matthew 20 had never been understood by any other company. Why? Because Jesus Christ did not present to them such absolute truth. And why is it that Jesus Christ did not present to them? Because they are not the particular object in view. The particular object in view is the 11th hour call, the last call, the fifth call. Therefore, at the time when Jesus Christ will begin to present to them this absolute truth, then for sure, those who are honest and sincere, they could immediately grasp the true meaning and fully understand the, the history 
of structures in the generation in which they were living. Now, for example, I would like to read to you this statement in Old Symbolic Code. To Symbolic Code, number 10, page 4. Now, let us read the statement. It says, and it is entitled, The Loud Cry. Now, it says, question. Sister White wrote in 1892 that the loud cry of the Third Angel's message had already begun. Others claim that it is yet future. Please explain. Answer. Those who think that the loud cry of the Third Angel's message which began in 1892 has continued ever since proved to us that they are in great darkness wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked because of the fact that they cannot tell the difference between that great light that lightens the earth and the darkness that preceded it which even a half awake christian ought to be able to recognize now first of all bt hotel says that before that great light that lightens the earth the darkness will precede first and that is the darkness mentioned in isaiah 60. now let us study closely and to repeat again understand what the bible teaches now the shepherds and says that there is darkness that precedes that great light that lightens the earth. Or in other words, the reason that God sent that great light is to lighten the earth by which gross darkness covers the earth. Now, I would like to read uh, Isaiah 60. Here in Isaiah chapter 60, this is the statement uh, given by or as predicted by prophet Isaiah the gospel prophet. It says, verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 2, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Isaiah 60, verse 1 and verse 2. And it is closely connected to Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 and verse 2. And it says, verse 1, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now, the first question is that, does the earth mentioned here is literal earth, or is it symbolical earth? Of course, there will be no neutral position, brothers and sisters. The earth mentioned here in Revelation 18, verse 1, it is either literal or symbolical earth. And since the shepherd's rod is plainly telling us that the revelation is not the prophecy itself. Here in us are page 221 i would like to read again that statement saying that we have stated before that the book of revelation is a revealing of prophecies and not a prophecy of itself to us are 221 Therefore, since Revelation 18 verse 1 is a revelation of the prophecy already recorded in the Old Testament, so it is a revelation of the prophecy recorded in, Re in Isaiah 60 verse, verse 2. Now, let us go back again to, to symbolic code number 10 page 4. To repeat again, the shepherd's rod is plainly telling us that the darkness that covers the whole earth precedes that event when the earth will be lightened with the glory of God. Now, let us continue to the next paragraph, to symbolic code number 10, page 4. The light with which the earth is to be lightened is, of course, understood to be a spiritual light, the Word of God. Moreover, it is also understood that the church is to diffuse this great light to the ends of the earth. So who will diffuse this great light? It is the church. What church? Remember, before, brothers and sisters, this event, that the earth will be lightened with the glory of the Lord, the earth will be be lighted with his glory. First, the predicted event that the earth, there is a gross spiritual darkness that covers the whole earth, must be fulfilled first before that event that the earth will be lightened with the glory of the Lord. Because it is illogical to lighten the place by which in reality there is no darkness at all. So the shepherd's rod says that the darkness covers the whole earth first and then it will be lightened with the glory of the Lord. And it is called spiritual darkness. Darkness. Now, let us read again the statement here in to symbolic code number 10, page 4. The light with which the earth is to be lightened is, of course, understood to be a spiritual light, the word of God. Moreover, it is also 
understood that the church is to diffuse this great light to the ends of the earth. For in no other way will God reveal the truth to sinful men. So there is no other medium, there is no other way that God could save humanity except by the channel of His church. The same statement in 2 S.R. 266 saying that only by the gospel proclamation can God save His people through that spiritual house. So the only way, the only medium that God could save humanity is through the gospel proclamation and that gospel is entrusted by God to His church and that church will be the one to to diffuse such great light that had been deposited by God into the church to save humanity. Now, it says here, consequently, the church from 1844 to the close of provision is divided into two sections, the church before the loud cry and the church in the time of the loud cry, the latter of which will, by comparison, be far superior to the former in spirituality. In fact, there is no comparison between the two. Hence, those who cannot tell in which one of these stages the church now is must be in great darkness. Now, the Shambhas Rod explained detailing that the church is divided into two divisions, the church before the loud cry and the church in the time of the loud cry. Now, let me ask you a simple question. Does in 1930, that is already the period of the church in the time of the loud cry? Now, if that is the period, the commencement of the period of the church in the time of the loud cry, what church? Is it the Seventh-day Adventist church? Now, think it thoroughly, brothers and sisters. The commission that was given by God to the loud cry proclamation is to go to all nations. And there is no such statement in the shepherd's rod that the Seventh-day Adventist church had been given such commission to go to all the world or to all nations. And you might say, it is the this day organization. Does the Deus, this day organization in 1930 to 1955 is a church organization or is it just an association? If you will be saying that the, this day organization is a church organization, then God have two churches, brothers and sisters, in that period of time. But the divine principle of God, that when God will raise up a church, another church, brothers and sisters, indicates that he already rejected the previous church. Now, let us now study closely. Let us apply the statement in the days in which we are living now. If we cannot tell in, in which one of these stages the church now is, then we must be in the great darkness. And for sure, concerning the Seventh-day Adventist Church, brothers and sisters, yes, it is in a great darkness. Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. In poor symbolic code 10 to 12, page 3, it says, This is attested by the fact that today we have thousands of isms, which are the result of thousands of interpretation of the scriptures, which proves that men have independently of the spirit Spirit interpreted the scriptures. For the spirit prophecy does not and cannot give to one person one interpretation of scripture and give to another another interpretation of the same scripture. Moreover, since it is true that the Laodicean church does not know the prophecies concerning herself, it bears evidence that the spirit prophecy is no longer active in the midst of her. For symbolic code 10 to 12, page 3. So the reason why such church is blind, naked, poor, miserable, brothers and sisters, that she did not know her own destiny because the spirit of prophecy, the active living for prophecy is no longer manifesting in the midst of her, brothers and sisters, according to the voice of inspiration and in that reading. For symbolic code 10 to 12 on page 3. Now, let us go back again to our study and ascertain clearly brothers and sisters what period of time we are now living in if there was a promise in 2SR 237 that Jesus Christ will present to his church the exact time of her history by periods whoever the church will be for sure they will fully understand their destinations from the time they did exist brothers and sisters from the opening and the closing I, I remember Remember the, the statement in page 68 and page 69. It says, Though this engrossing subject is but briefly treated herein, yet for lucidity, harmony, and logic, the truth of it stands peer to any. It gives a prophetic outline of church history from Miller's time to the present day. I would like to apply this statement in the very days in which we are living. 
showing the opening and the closing of its movement, also its work and destiny. Now, I think this statement is more definitely applied to the final and the last movement because in the vision of Zechariah, they were represented as having seven eyes. Now, here in 1 TG number 14, I would like to read the statement. It says on page 21, so here it says, What a momentous day! What a great people! Reading 1 TG 14.21 What a momentous day! What a great people! Evidently, they constitute the stone of Zechariah 3, which we studied several weeks ago and learned that it has seven eyes, complete spiritual vision. Obviously, this is the stone that smite the great image of Daniel 2. Verse 45, and we know, brothers and sisters, that it points out to the 11th hour call, the 11th hour church. So here in 1 TG 14, 21, they were illustrated of having seven eyes, meaning complete spiritual vision. That is the description given by the Bible as explained by the shepherd's rod. Now, going back again to our subject in 2SR 2034, I would like to read again, brothers and sisters. It says, and you can read again um, at your own leisure, but I would like to reemphasize again the, the chief reason for only two kinds of cereals is to draw our attention to the first and the last call. Now, it says here in page 234, Now, the question, why the voice from the throne said, One measure of wheat for a penny first, and three measures of barley for a penny last will be answered. And we know that that voice that coming from the throne is God the Father, right? In 2SR 222, it is God the Father. Uh, the great Jehovah is, is speaking. And it says, humanly speaking, it should have been the reverse. For by the wit is represented the last message, 11th hour. So it is the 11th hour, the message in the 11th hour. What is the message of the 11th hour? If, if you will read to us our 230, 231, it says, What is the message? The 11th hour message is none other than Revelation 18, the loud cry of the third angel. I would like to read again, 2SR 230 and 231. What is the message? The 11th hour message is none other than Revelation 18, the loud cry of the third angel. Quoting testimonies to ministers, page 59, the same message, the third angels, is to be proclaimed the second time. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and will accomplish its work. The Great Controversy, page 390. Now, let us go back again to the reading in 2SR 2034 and then focus our attention to Revelation 18, verse 1, brothers and sisters, by which it is connected to the prophecy in Isaiah 60, verse 1 and verse 2. Now, it says, Now, the question, why the voice from the throne said one measure of wheat for a penny, first and three measures of barley for a penny, last will be answered. Humanly speaking, it should have been the reverse, for by the wheat is represented the last man says the 11th hour and by the barley the first early in the morning Israel going out of Egypt now here brothers and sisters we can easily understand that these two serials is pointing to the type and anti-type Israel going out of Egypt Israel after the flesh but we are now focusing our attention to the particular object in view to the antitypical fulfillment Israel going out of Egypt, by which B.T. Honeb says in 2SR 275, it is still future in his days. And I would like to read again, it says, you will also note on page 222 that the 430 prophetic years originally applied to Abraham and his seed overlap the 430 of Ezekiel chapter 4. The 430 years of Ezekiel should terminate in 1929 or 1930, but the perfect fulfillment of the prophetic period of Abraham in its antitype is yet in the future going out of Egypt. The chart on page 212-213 shows its termination in 1930 for us. We stated before, it is outlined by the coincidences which perfectly fit the prophecy of Ezekiel. As it is impossible to make a time chart without any date to go by, we have used these coincidences and it is stated that the date is indefinite. See chart on page 133. Ezekiel's prophecy is intended to point forward 
to the announcement of the projected reformation and the one through Abraham to its completion in Ezekiel chapter 9. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in this paragraph, there are two things that are very important. First, we need to understand that that prophetic event going out of Egypt, by which in 1SR page 64, that if we are Israelites indeed, we need to prepare for that event. What event? The departure from Egypt. And Peter Hodip says that that departure from Egypt is still future in his days. 2 S. R. 2 75. But the fact is that the entire Shepherd's Rod publication, the intention why this Shepherd's Rod publications had been written is to point forward, brothers and sisters, to the announcement of the predicted reformation. Or in other words, this focal point of the Shepherd's Rod publications is to inform God's people that final effort of revival and reformation. And this is the last reading and we will continue. Brothers and sisters, here in 1 TG, number 41, page 29, it says here, this chapter of Isaiah the prophet is indeed to bring 1 TG 41, page 29. This chapter of Isaiah the prophet is indeed to bring revival and reformation such as has never taken place since the beginning of sin. God forbid that any one of us should miss the experience and the blessings that come through this revival and reformation. Therefore, the reason that we are now studying the Shepherd's Rod publications because the principle reason why this inspired writings, the Shepherd's Rod publications, had been written, the intention is to announce, to inform the people in the last generation of men when God will launch the final effort of such revival and reformation and admonishing us that, if possible, none of us should miss the experience of this revival and reformation, but rather to be a part and to be among this predicted revival and reformation. We will continue this subject and may the good Lord bless you and have a wonderful evening.